Okay, in this video we're learning about functions and how to define functions and how to basically disprove something that's not a function. We really need to understand what these things are because the rest of what we're learning about this year has to deal with some type of a function. Um, so again, the big thing is to figure out and understand the rule breakers of a function and we'll discuss those at length here in a little bit. Um, determining whether relations are functions, it says a relation is um, a relation is a pair of inputs and outputs. When a relation gives an ordered pair, the x coordinates are the inputs, the y coordinates are the outputs, and a relation that pairs each input with exactly one output is a function. So basically, for every x, there's a new y. You can't have x1 comma y1 and then also in that function have x1 comma y2 and again x and y are just arbitrary numbers there but basically it's saying we have the rule that you can't have your inputs repeated so when we look at the different ways that functions can be displayed um, here are some things that are not graphs and we'll get to graphs here in just a moment but it says determine whether each relation is a function and explain why. For our purposes, you guys, um, if you can say the definition of a function for yes, that's perfectly fine. What I'm more focused on in this lesson is if you can tell me the no's. So looking at example 1a, you notice all of these x's are different. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what's going on. All I'm looking for is for a repeat in the x value. And because I don't have that in the first one, I'm going to say for sure I already know that yes, that one is a function. The second one, I have 4, 8, 6, 4, and 5. Uh, the red flag here that I'm going to watch for are the inputs that are the same. So I have 4 mapping to 0 and 4 also mapping to 3. That breaks our rule, so we say no, it's not a function. Next one, again, we look at our x values. We have 2, negative 1, 0, 0, 1. So again, right here, we have 0 going to 5 and 0 going to 6. That is where our rule is broken. Notice up above, we had some problems in A where a bunch of stuff was mapping to the same y value. That doesn't break the rule. We have negative 2 mapping to 2. We have negative 1 mapping to 2 and 0 mapping to 2. Then we had 1 mapping to 0 and 2 mapping to 0. The definition of a function, though, is that each input has exactly one output. It doesn't matter that there's repeat outputs. It, it matters if there's repeat inputs. So, again here, we look at this last example, and we see 1 going to 4, 3 going to 15, and 11 going to 15. This is okay. This does not break any rules. Each input has exactly one output. Now, on the flip side of that, let's say that I had one also mapping to 15. If something like that happens, then it's a no. If you have one input going to two different outputs in a mapping, that is a no for a function. Take a couple seconds here, pause the video, try these problems on a piece of paper. Again, this is for your benefit, making sure that you understand what's going on. I'll go ahead and answer them, though. So number one, we see that we have negative 5, 0, 5, and 5. Right here, we see a broken rule, so number one is no. Number two, negative 4, negative 1, 2, 5, and 10. We already see that that's okay, so number two is yes. That can be considered a function. 2, 4, and 6 on the next one, we can say yes on that one as well. Obviously, on the last one, negative one or one half mapping to three different things, that's a no. So again, one, no, two, yes, three, yes, four, no. Again, the two big things that I want you to understand this lesson is how to disprove that something is, a, is not a function. I want you to understand those things mainly. The first one, again, each input has exactly one output. I can't say that enough. Each input has exactly one output. Along those same lines, we have what's called the vertical line test. So if you're ever given a picture and you can draw a vertical line and hit 
somewhere on your graph or on your function two times, that means that it is not a function. doesn't mean that it's not a relationship of some kind that we'll see in the future. It just means it's not a function. So here's your example of a vertical line test. So again, um, it's kind of using the same thing. It doesn't necessarily always have to be a line, but right away in number one or example 2A, we see if we do a vertical line test, it breaks the rule two different times in example A, whereas in um, example 2B, we really don't have that issue because it's a horizontal line through there. So if I drew a vertical line anywhere, it wouldn't break the rule. So determining yes or no, and again, when it's yes, you can just say definition of a function. When it's no, you're going to have to give either vertical line test or two inputs have it, uh, or it, yeah, one input has two outputs, things like that. So again, this is a practice for you. Pause the video. Um, and you can just jot down yes, no, whatever you think it is, but jot down what you think these things are, whether they're functions or not. Again, I'm going to go ahead and put the answers. The first one is yes. The second one is yes. Number uh, three or number seven here, excuse me, is the only one in this little um, exercise that's no. It doesn't pass the vertical line test, so it's not a function. Last one is still yes. Again, on any of these, make sure you ask questions. If you have them, you're likely to see questions just like this on a test or a quiz. Next one, we have words associated with input and output. And again, we talked about this earlier. Every single function has an input variable, typically it's x, and an output variable, typically it's y. Other words that are associated with that, again, we just said input and output. We also have words like um, domain. Domain is the collection of inputs. Range is the collection of outputs. And you guys have seen these words before. Uh, we'll also see independent and dependent here sh soon. So we could add that as well to our set of words that we need to understand here. So we could say independent and dependent. Now, there's something new and kind of interesting that's going to happen in this class. You're going to start to discuss domain and ranges of functions that don't just have points and functions that go on and on forever. Now, ex for as far as example 3a goes, this is pretty typical. This is something that you've seen. So if you see this on a homework assignment, all you're going to do is basically write down the coordinate points like they have here. They have a list of the coordinate points. And if I ask you for the domain, you're just going to tell me the x's or the inputs. So negative 3, negative 1, 1, and 3 are your domain. Negative 2, 0, 2, and 4 is your range or your outputs. Now, what's different about this next one and again, keep in mind, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff like this this year. Um, you're going to need to understand, well, what about all these values in between in my function? So if I look, you know, I'm not just talking about the coordinate points, but I'm talking about any point along that line there. And there's infinitely many answers, even between the numbers 0 and 1. When I say, okay, is the x value 1 half part of that function? Yes, it is. Is the x value 1 50th in that function? Sure. You could make your denominator anything. So we can't just say a list of numbers for domain and range. We need to give an interval. What I always tell my students is to act like you're going to smash this thing to the axis that you're talking about for domain or range. So when we're talking about the x um, axis, we're talking about the domain. So if I smash this function to the x-axis, I'm going to start here and I'm going to finish here. So if I look at that, that's that line right there from negative 2 to positive 3. So that's what I'm going to write for my domain. Negative 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 3. Same thing applies for your range, except for your range, you're going to smash it to the y-axis. So if I smash this function to the y-axis, it starts at negative 1, and it goes up to negative 2. So my range, and again, my range is dealing with y values instead of x, but negative 1 is less than or equal to y, 
which is less than or equal to 2. That takes some time and some getting used to, but keep in mind, we're not just talking about five numbers here. We're talking about infinitely many answers, and this is the most correct way to answer that. So take a shot at doing this. Now, again, keep in mind that it, when it's just points, you can just write out your answer. You can write the X values and the Y values. You don't need to repeat for domain and range. But I want you to take a valid effort here and try to write down your domain and range, and keeping in mind that number 10, it's going to be an interval. Again, I'm going to go ahead and write it down. So if I look at my X values here, I'm going to get negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 for my domain. My range, I'm going to get 0. Typically, we go from least to greatest, 2, and 4. Now, uh, for domain on the next one, again, we smash it to the axis that we're talking about. So if I smash this to the x-axis, it's going to start here and finish here. So it looks like I'm going from 1 less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 5. Hopefully we all got that. For the y values, if I smash this to the y-axis, it starts here and finishes here. So I have 0 less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 4. Now keep in mind, when we're graphing later on in the year, we're going to be drawing arrows on the ends of these functions. So when it doesn't come to a point, we're going to have to know and understand what that means when the arrows go on and on forever. So if this function continues up forever, am I going to need to put an interval? Or would it be something as simple as saying y is greater than or equal to 0? Same thing with my x's. Does my x stop and end here, or can I plug in whatever I want? We'll have to come up with a new way to explain our domain. The last set of variables, and I talked about this just a little bit ago, and if you just want to add that to your notes, just like we talked about, the best way that I can explain independent and dependent events is that I can plug whatever I want in for x, and y is going to depend on what I plug in for x. So that's why I always remember the y is the dependent variable. It depends on what I plug in for x in any function. So we have an example here. Um, not all of your problems in your homework will give you the function. Sometimes we'll have to make it up, but most of the time we're going to have something that is going to be pretty easy to work with. So... If we look at this function here, it says the function y is equal to negative 3x plus 12 represents the amount of fluid ounces of juice remaining in the bottle after you take x gulps. Um, so apparently this, this lady is taking some gulps and it's taking away so many fluid ounces per gulp. I don't know how one would measure a gulp. It's interesting. Anyway, so first of all, what they do is they give us a domain. Now, in a function like this, obviously you don't want to incorporate negatives, but keep in mind later on we might want a function that has some negative values. So typically what I do with my functions is I go from negative 2 to positive 2, but in one like this where you're working with something that is existing right there, you're probably not going to want any of your negative values. Um, and you guys can read this over, pause the video, read it over, but this is a pretty self-explanatory way to do something like this. They take their x values, they plug it into the function, here's how many ounces are left in the bottle after that many gulps. Um, and I expect that you guys would have no problem graphing something like this because my input is this, my output is this, I can plot 0, 12, 1, 9, and so on and so forth. It wouldn't be a, a tall order for you guys to be able to graph something like that. Last one here, again, you're given a function. Let's do a, 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 a table for um, part B on number 11. And the big thing is make sure that you can identify independent and dependent events like it asks for an A, um, or excuse me, not events, but variables. Other than that, these are pretty self-explanatory. So let's just talk through this really quick. Number 11A, we have the independent variable B and the dependent variable, the dependent variable A. If I made a table 
at zero, I'm going to have zero comma 14, one comma 10, two comma, let's see, 14 minus eight will give me six and three comma two. And if I were to plot points, it would look like that. Again, range is going to be these values on the right. You're not going to have pieces of avocado left over, and you're not going to talk about the stuff in between. So for range, you're simply going to put 2, 6, 10, and 14. Um, number 12, A, identify independent and dependent. Um, independent. Independent is going to be M. Dependent is going to be T. And again, um, you guys can plug in your stuff here and solve and ask questions if you have them. But my video is going to run long here, and so I'm going to let you go, go ahead and get to the homework. Ask questions if you have them. Thanks, guys.